Please allow me to introduce you to our exceptional speaker, Professor Tuchtman. Professor Tuchtman teaches at the University of Law of Mannheim in Germany, and she has been doing an intensive research in IP topics, particularly patent law, mainly in the context of private international law and international civil law uh, procedure law. She has been uh, so kind to prepare a short paper on the presentation, which we will upload together with the slides of this presentation at 4AP Council website after this webinar. Also, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter to receive updates on relevant academic studies, future webinars, and case law summaries. Without further delay, Professor Tuchterman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Claudia, for the kind introduction. And I'm, uh, I thank you all for joining me today for um, my presentation in this um, webinar. And I will start um, right away. Well, at present, it uh, is widely discussed that the grant of a patent injunction might be possibly seen as disproportionate, whether patent concerns uh, concern protect, protects a technology which perhaps is only a minor component of a much more complex system. So it is said the potential effect of the injunction to stop the use of the system as a whole might be seen as excessive. Um, the question therefore now is whether the automatic grant of an injunction has to be put into question. In order to tackle this, I will give you an overview of the legal foundations and of the practical implications, uh, implications of patent injunctions, both with regard to selected European jurisdictions and on the European patent law. Um, the focus, of course, will be on the potential proportionality. Um, I might also say that I will analyze this hypo hypothesis um, only from a purely statutory perspective. So what are the relevant statutes? Um, as you are all aware of, um, the, um, uh, I, will talk, well, I will talk first about the um, TRIPS agreement of 1995. As you are all aware of, the aim to establish uh, a certain convergence in the enforcement of intellectual property rights is internationally recognized, and that is namely by the TRIPS agreement and by the Enforcement Directive of 2004. Um, the tri TRIPS agreement, in order to reduce distortions in international trade, identifies effective and appropriate means for the enforcement of trade-related intellectual property rights um, as one of uh, the primary needs. And in doing so, however, it also acknowledges the differences of national legal systems. Turning to the contents of um, uh, material contents of the TRIPS agreement, um, its Article 44.1, Para 1 on injunctions, states the judicial authorities um, shall have the authority to order a party to desist from an infringement. Now, in the current context of this presentation, it is particularly noteworthy that Article 44 on injunctions does not state any requirement of proportionality of any sort in the granting of such injunctions. If the drafters of the TRIPS agreement had intended to institute such a precondition, they would have explicitly done so. And this is deduced by comparison to, for example, Article 46 of the of the TRIPS agreement concerning other remedies, which explicitly mentions a need for proportionality in considering such requests. Mm, at first glance, if we also have a look at Article 41, Para 2 on general obligations, um, this calls for fair and equitable procedures concerning the enforcement of intellectual property rights, and that may seem as an adequate basis for a requirement for proportionality. However, 
or by it being a general statement, this merely pertains to the court procedure of granting an injunction, but it may not be read as a demand to take a proportionate decision on the merits. This finding is also underlined by Article 42 on fair and equitable procedures, which similarly focuses entirely on procedural aspects. So this, um, this art, these articles, um, they cannot be seen as a basis for a proportionality requirement. Um, another issue is uh, whether the TRIPS would at all allow for a restriction to an injunction um, injunction based on proportionality grounds. It has frequently been argued that Article 30 TRIPS may be construed in a way to allow for individual exceptions to the exclusivity right of the patentee, which are to be granted by judges, deciding on the enforcement of the patent. So, uh, in the particular case. Article 30, um, you can see it on the slide, it says um, members may provide limited exceptions to the exclusive rights conferred by a patent and so on and so forth. Well, several reasons speak against a broad reading of this decision, uh, provision. First, the wording clearly addresses the extent of the patent as a substantive exclusivity right. Um, it, describes, it describes exceptions to the rights conferred and thus it potentially limits their scope. Uh, also the pro provision addresses members and that leads to the assumption that uh, the exceptions should only be granted by TRIP trips member states as legislators of their own law and not by court judges applying the law. Uh, secondly, a method, methodical argument um, tied to the structure of the trips may be made, um, and that is that Article 30 may be found in the chapter of, on substantial provisions, more pre precisely on the granting of patent, patents, and that the extent of the exclusivity right awarded by it. And um, if this was meant as a cap on procedural remedies such as injunctions, we would expect this to be embedded in part three of the agreement on the enforcement of IP rights. Hence, my first finding is that the TRIPS agreement does not stipulate any mandatory proportionality requirement in the granting of an injunction. What does the enforcement directive say? Um, this is a further legal source uh, to be uh, contemplated because it sets the stage for an effective enforcement of patent right. Um, however, as the TRIPS, um, also the enforcement directive does not expressly stipulate a proportionality requirement for the granting of an injunction. Um, the uh, conditions for granting of injunctions are left for the national legal orders to determine. However, it is worth to, to take a closer look. Considering the material provisions of the directive, it is noteworthy that the proportionality, in fact, is mentioned in several instances, however, not explicitly in Article 11 with respect to injunctions. Um, if we look, for example, on the general statement in Article 3, Para 2, um, according to which the remedies prescribed by the directive shall also be proportionate, um, we might say that the wording is, um, uh, is clear as it shall apply to all remedies mentioned in the following, so after Article 3, and that also includes injunctions. Yet, despite of this general statement, a number of the following provisions explicitly set out a proportionality requirement again. So this is the case for Article 10, Para 3, for example, um, concerning the request for corrective provisional measures, and the same holds true for Article 8, Para 1, um, uh, concerning a request for information. Um, uh, being made. 
Mm, so on the basis, uh, on this basis, it may be it's assumed that the general statement regarding proportionality, which is made in Article 3, Para 2, is of a rather declaratory character. This is also supported by the observation that in the same sentence, Article 3, Para 2 also calls for the remedies to be effective and dissuasive. So allowing for an application of uh, the proportionality requirements such as to exclude injunctions, this must always be balanced against the effectiveness and dissuasiveness of the remedy. And if at all, this should only be permitted by applying very high standards. Finally, um, Article 12 of the Enforcement Directive addresses proportionality of measures against the infringer, but in a very explicit manner. It provides for a specific instrument. It opens to the judicial authorities the possibility, um, may the wording is instead of shall, of ordering pecuniary pecuniary compensation instead of an injunction in cases where the infringement was committed unintentionally and without ne negligence. Um, furthermore, uh, the, uh, it, is, it shall only apply in cases where the measure in question would cause disproportionate harm to the person held liable. Um, Article 12 also applies to injunctions. Hence, it does not con constitute a general proportionality requirement, but an exemption clause which only targets faultless infringement. <clears throat> so if at all, this shows that the drafters very carefully considered the aspect of proportionality of injunctive, injunctive relief, and they chose not to insert a general ex exception. In fact, it applies only in very narrow cases of faultless behavior. Um, so only for these very specific cases, there is a, a specific um, possibility to prescribe pecuniary um, compensation. For um, my ongoing presentation, I would ask you, However, to keep both provisions, Article 12 and Article 3 of the Enforcement Directive, particularly in mind. Just to be complete very briefly, what about the European Patent Convention? Well, that is clear. Um, naturally, the EPC does not set out any requirements for claiming an injunction. According to Article 63, Para 3 EPC, any infringement of a European patent shall be dealt with by national law. So on the, in the following, I will give you a short overview of the preconditions for injunctions in selected European jurisdictions and focusing again on a possible proportionality requirement. Um, I will also address the UPCA after that. Of course, I will start with patent injunctions in German law. Section 139 of the German Patent Act grants a right to claim an injunction against anyone using a patent invention contrary to sections 9 or 10 of the German Patent Act. And uh, section 9 describes the scope of the application of a patent of patent protection in terms of um, granting a right to use to the, uh, to, for the patent holder and also a right for him to exclude all others um, for, from such use without um, his or her consent. Um, it should be mentioned that a claim for an injunction in Germany is rooted in substantive and not in procedural law. Hence, if the preconditions of Article 139 Patent Act, which is a substantive provisions, um, provision, are met, the injunction must be granted. There is no procedural leeway for judges to abstain from granting an injunction on the basis of any proportionality considerations. However, as you all or as many of you might have heard, it is an ongoing discussion in Germany whether proportionality should be part of the picture, especially because of the standards imposed by the enforcement directive. But what does German substantive patent law say about proportionality? First, Germany does not have a general proportionality requirement mirroring Article 3, Para 2 of the Enforcement Directive. 
And second, Germany has not implemented Article 12 of the Enforcement Directive, um, calling for an alternative measure of pecuniary compensation, as I have just mentioned. Under um, the German patent law, only claims for destruction and recall of products are subjected to an explicit proportionality requirement according to Section 100, 140A, Para 3 of the Patent Act. However, this does not mean that German patent law does not call for proportionality in awarding substantive claims. First and foremost, uh, every interference with the constitutional guarantee of ownership, um, Article 13, uh, 14 of the Basic Law, um, and including also patent ownership, has to be justified against the backdrop of the proportionality principle. In general civil law, this is implement implemented by virtue of the good faith principle. Hence, a potential infringer may raise the defense of the disproportionality against an injunction by invoking good faith, and that would be done by, uh, based on Section 242 of the German Civil Code. For example, the federal, German Federal Supreme Court in its Wermetauscher decision of 2016 held that an immediate enforcement of an injunction and even considering, considering the legitimate interests of the patent holder vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the infringer may constitute a disproportionate severity that could not be justified by the exclusivity of the patent right and therefore was considered to be contrary to good faith. The court defined this standard uh, in a decision where it had to consider the granting of a grace period for the infringer to accomplish transition and elimination measures. However, uh, the federal Supreme Court had never done this assessment with respect to patent cases, so it drew, so it drew its criteria but, uh, from the area of competition law and also legal literature. Um, I would like to stress that the Supreme Court defined very high thresholds here, um, accounting for the very nature of patent infringement. Um, it said that because the infringement is a direct consequence of, for example, the manufacture of a protected product, it is a necessary consequence of an injunction that the infringer would have to cease production the consequential hardship is to be accepted, said the Federal Supreme Court. Um, a limitation to the effects of a patent, of, to these effects of a patent, is only justified if and because an absolute prohibition is intolerable. So this is or would cause a, an intolerable hardship. Um, so this is a very high threshold. Interestingly, uh, in this particular decision, um, the court ruled that the threshold was not met and a um, grace period was not to be granted. Very, very briefly now um, concerning patent injunctions in the UK. Here it uh, can be said that, ne or said that neither Article 3 nor Article 12 Enforcement Directive have been um, uh, implemented directly or implicitly. Um, English courts rather see themselves as being authorized on the basis of their equity law tradition not to grant cease and desist orders if there is um, disproportionality. However, um, this is considered only for very rare and exceptional cases. Uh, as Judge Pumphrey in the decision Navitaire put it, um, um, the effect um, of the um, the effect of the grant of the injunction would be grossly disproportionate to the right protected. Um, only in these cases there can be um, there can be no injunction. And the word, quoting again, the word grossly avoids any suggestion that all that has to be done is to strike a balance of convenience. So this quote by itself might lead to the assumption that the German and the UK law are not too far apart when it comes to the results. 
um, in applying the law because in the UK we can also see a very high standard. In France, um, again, the, um, uh, the injunction is uh, also a remedy of right, which will systematically also follow a uh, finding of an infringement, like in Germany. Um, the injunctive relief is considered a natural consequence of finding the infringement. Article 12 has also not been implemented in French law. Um, Article 3, para 2 of the Enforcement Directive is sometimes sporadically addressed by um, French judges, but is not also automatically addressed. And um, French judges basically have denied injunctive relief mainly in two circumstances, which is under a competition law defense or also under an abuse of rights defense. So here as well, there is no general proportionality assessment in each and every case of patent infringement and injunction claims. The UPCA, turning to the UPCA, well, um, even though the prospects of this are uh, still somewhat unpredictable, I think it is still worthwhile to take a look at the UPCA and the rules of procedure because after all, this is a body of harmonized European law and experts uh, in patent litigation from all over Europe have discussed for details, um, uh, for decades, in order to establish a common ground for the patent litigation before the UPC. And they try to kind of create a kind of best of all worlds. Well, what does the UPC agreement say? Um, surprisingly, Article 63 UPCA on injunctions does not feature a proportionality requirement, as you can see on the slide. Um, in fact, Article 63 is a literal implementation of Article 11 Enforcement Directive. A um, preliminary remark has to be made about the legal nature of this provision. It um, clearly reflects a continental European understanding um, that um, a procedural order of an injunction is a result of a substantive cease and desist claim. And therefore, there is no procedural discretion of the judges not to grant an injunction if it considers, uh, if it, considers it un. Uh, disproportionate. And therefore, any counter arguments against a cease and desist order must be asserted under substantive law. But would Article 63 allow for such counter arguments? There has been some discussion whether the wording in Article 63, I will just once um, um, turn back, the wording may grant. Um, still confers uh, discretion upon the judges not to grant the injunction despite a clear infringement. The predominant opinion here reject, rejects this point of view though. Um, hence, if the court finds after all consideration of counter arguments that there is an infringement, an injunction is imperative. Um, so um, arguing on the substantive claim the defendant will have enough opportunity to raise counter arguments. Um, just to be complete on the wording may, which has been used here, this is, uh, this is seen as a way to give legal authority to the UPC as a court to grant um, cease and desist orders. Um, Further mention has to be uh, made that there is no special provision on pecuniary, pecuniary relief um, uh, mirroring Article 12 of the Enforcement Directive that I have been just talking about. So this special um, provision has not been implemented in um, the UPCA. There has been a rule um, uh, mirroring this until the 16th draft of the rules of procedure, but this has been um, deleted. Um, this leads to the um, this leads to be to the question whether the defendant can claim disproportionality as an argument based on substantive law under the UPC. 
um, the, the legal basis for a cease and desist claim with respect to European patents with unitary effect is Article 5 of the EPUE regulation combined with Article 25 of the UPCA. I have, um, uh, you can see both provisions on the slide before you. If you read them, um, I will not read them, spell them out to you, but if, if you have a closer look of, at both of these provisions, you will see that there is no proportionality requirement included in these um, provisions. Well, um, the effect of uh, this legal basis of these provisions may be limited by the restrictions from Article 3, Para 2 of the Enforcement Directive, um, according to which uh, remedies shall be proportionate, uh, which I have mentioned before. Mm. This is still possible, but as I said, Article 3 is a general statement. The final question, therefore, is whether defenses of proportionality before the UPC might be raised under the applicable national law um, according to Article 24 of the UPCA. Well, in my opinion, the UPCA and the EPUE um, ref uh, which, which refer to the enforcement directive, they are comprehensive and binding on the issue of proportionality. And therefore, there can be no recurrence to national law. Um, this is also uh, this is also show, uh, on, shown by uh, several other provisions of the UPCA, which explicitly address proportionality. And here some examples are Article 60, Article 62, and Article 68. But, but as I said, Article 63 concerning injunctions, it does not have a proportionality requirement. Hence, if the drafters of the UPCA took a deliberate choice not to include a proportionality requirement in Article um, or they took a deliberate choice not to include a proportionality requirement in Article 63, and there's no room for the application of national patent law. However, concerning non-patent law defenses, such as the objection of, of good faith, this, in my opinion, may still be raised on the basis of national law, but with a potentially limited scope, it also has under national law with high thresholds. Well, so far I have focused on the issue um, of proportionality under the current law, but I would also like to add some thoughts on the issue if I should have one. My general approach is that a general proportionality assessment as requirement for granting an injun injunction might uh, may be hazardous. Um, without specific standards prescribed by law, it would severely disturb the balance of the patent system as a whole. What balance is this? Patent law is driven by the underlying idea that the technology behind the patent shall be made available to the general public in order to um, further technical knowledge of the society as a whole. Um, this is supposed to reduce necessary investment in research and to target the investments better. Um, so others can build on the knowledge provided um, uh, for by patents and they can um, they can um, make or they can further this knowledge and make further inventions. And also um, uh, by uh, making inventions known to the general public, um, this also um, prohibits the generating of double costs. So here disclosure actually is an efficient means of innovation. Well, while this is evidently very desirable from the point of view of the society as a whole, the prospect of being used and copied is not as appealing to innovators. So we need an incentive to disclose innovations. And this is um, where the patent system comes in. The uh, patent holders are granted a temporary monopoly for the use of the invention. They alone may decide who is allowed to use the patented inventions. 
the patent laws as they stand, they clearly describe the um, scope and the dis uh, dis restrictions of the patent right as a temporary, temporary monopoly. Um, and they provide for a clear balance. Within these limits, the injunction is, a, is central for the effective enforcement of the patent right because it bears much more deterrent potential as, for example, a damage remedy because it gives um, potentially the power to exclude a competitor from the market. My argument is that uh, introducing a general proportionality requirement for any injunction would actually equal an unwritten restriction of the patent right as such. In essence, it, in essence, it would mirror a compulsory license, but the conditions for compulsory licenses, they're clearly spelled, spelled out in the Patent Act. Um, to put the grant of an injunction into question by applying any vague criterion on, of proportionality would massively endanger legal certainty. And it would also put the deliberate choice of the, of the legislator to balance the interests concerned into question. I have so far not been convinced that our existing, existing system, namely the automatic grant of an injunction in case of an infringement, is overly detrimental to the potential infringer. Um, the competitors actually have ample opportunity to, to attack unjustified patents in opposition and for Germany nullity proceedings. Um, in short, I am not in favor of a general amendment. And I am of the, of the firm opinion um, that because of the serious consequence of a proportionality requirement, it is only acceptable if it is positively codified by the legislator. Actually, if it was codified, I would also prefer the definition of very strict standards. From the perspective of the law as it stands, there is no sufficient legal basis for such a requirement. Actually, that the, um, that the legislature is fully aware of the specific rules to strike an acceptable compromise is underlined by the Trade, Secret Di Trade Secrets Directive. Um, this was implemented um, very much to the, uh, to the wording by uh, the German legislature, at least concerning um, proportionality. So just let us ca catch a glimpse on... Um, on this um, on this provision, um, in general, according to um, according to the trade secrets directive, an injunction may be granted against an infringer for obtaining, using, or disclosing a trade secret without authorization. But all remedies under the tr uh, under the trade secrets directive they are subject to a proportionality assessment. Um, which is spelled out in Article 13 of um, the Trade Secrets Directive or Know-How Directive, as I have written in, on, on the slides. Um, this, this Article 13 has been directly um, introduced into the German Trade Secret Act, which is actually in force um, now. It, uh, it, is, uh, it is very much mirrored in um, the German law. And um, what, uh, what can be deduced from this provision? Um, here, several points have to be noted. Firstly, the, provisions, the provision works on the assumption that an infringement is positively found. And only as an exception in particular cases, the remedies following from the infringement may be excluded if their enforcement would be disproportionate. So this underlines the exceptional character of the provision. Secondly, in order to guide the proportionality assessment, there is uh, the provision sets out a, a list, of list of criteria, um, making it clear which points can be taken into consideration. But how can it be justified that the same uh, in brackets, German legislator, within the same area of IP law, considers a proportionality assessment to be justified with respect to trade, se 
secrets infringement, but not with respect to patent law infringement. While the answer relates to the difference between the rights which are granted. While the patent right is an absolute right, right excluding all others from the unauthorized use of the patented invention. Um, on the other hand, trade secrets, they aren't fully fledged IP rights. They share many, but not all features of traditional IP. The object of protection uh, of trade secrets is only the fact that the information is secret and not the information itself. The owner also has to take active steps to keep secrecy. Um, the aim is to prevent information from being leaked to the general public, while in case of patent protection, um, the, the aim is to make the invention known. And therefore, the public interest uh, in both cases is, is um, very different. Um, accordingly, the proportionality assessment in both, both cases must be very um, different. I will add one more thought, which is that there is also a major different from difference between both legal fields from the perspective of the infringer. With regards to patents, there is a public register and therefore any person acting in the market um, has to ensure that it has freedom to operate. With regard to trade secrets, there is no means to find whether the knowledge gain from a third party has been legally obtained. Um, therefore, there is a considerable risk of faultless or contributory infringement of trade secrets. And here, therefore, um, the proportionality assessment may be a fair means to obtain a balance of interests. But on the other hand, with respect for pa of patent law injunctions, I would argue that it has to be much stricter. In essence, an effective and dissuasive injunction is the necessary compensation for the desirable disclosure of an invention. So what are my conclusions of the presentation? Um, the international instruments we have looked at, TRIPS and Enforcement Directive, they do not prescribe a specific proportionality requirement for injunctions. Um, the standards um, for proportionality um, under national laws are very high. The UPCA is uh, uh, silent on proportionality of injunctions. Um, uh, the general, a general proportionality assessment could severely disturb the patent system as a whole. And for the law as it stands now, now there is no sufficient legal basis for it. Um, it would require a um, specific explicit codification with high standards. Um, I would therefore... Uh, um, and this is, can be seen uh, such a specific um, codification. An example um, of this can be seen um, by uh, in Article 13 of the Know-How Directive or Section 9 of uh, the um, Trade Secrets Act in Germany. Well, this would be my um, opinion and I will very happily um, answer your questions in the Q&A. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for your excellent presentation and overview on injunctions and proportionality in Europe. Uh, we will open up the floor to any questions, but until we receive the uh, questions via the chat, uh, please let me start with, with the first question. Based on, on the German law as it is uh, now, what is the current court practice of assessing proportionality of injunctions? Well, um, in Germany, uh, there is, uh, even though we have, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, good faith defense that I have just uh, talked about, um, uh, this good faith defense is uh, only raised in very rare and exceptional circumstances. Um, and uh, it would also uh, be considered by the judges only in those very rare and uh, exceptional circumstances. So this is not an argument raised frequently. 
um, in the German court system. Um, I, uh, um, so based on this observation, we can say that um, uh, for the current practice in courts, um, the, uh, the courts, um, they will grant an injunction if they find the preconditions fulfilled, but they will not after that make a balance of interest um, between the two parties. Hmm. And, and should the proportionality assessment not already be a standard due to the preconditions of the European Enforcement Directive? Um, well, uh, Article 3, Para 2 actually could lead us to the conclusion that, um, uh, that proportionality has to be in the picture, um, also in the application of the law in each of the member states. So the judges, um, based on Article 3, Para 2, should um, uh, make a proportionality assessment. However, um, it is my argument that um, Article 3, Para 2 is only a general statement. And um, actually, it left, the enforcement directive left um, the issue of making, um, uh, especially in the injunctive relief, um, proportionate up to the legislators. So how to um, achieve the goal of proportionality prescribed in Article 3, Para 2 of the Enforcement Directive, this um, could, the legislators were free. And in Germany, for example, um, the, uh, the standard is prescribed by Article 3, Para 2 is met by um, the um, uh, the, 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 the possibility of the good faith defense, first of all, which is, of course, subject to very high assessment standards, but then proportionality can also be kept um, by making um, the, uh, the, the grant of the injunction um, by tying it to very, um, uh, very high security payments within the, uh, uh, within the court judgment. So in order to execute um, the injunction which is granted, um, the claimant has to pay a high security and therefore should also very, um, yeah, should also um, uh, consider whether it uses um, the judgment that it has received. Thank you. Um, I've seen some uh, questions so far. Um, part of it, uh, one of the uh, participants is uh, referring to the context of the standardization. Um, so the question is, all these messages that we have heard now in the presentation, will they apply also um, if you are dealing with the standard central pattern? So, for example, that the Court of Justice of the EU established a certain guidelines of framework to negotiate uh, for both um, parties uh, to avoid hold up and hold out. Uh, would you consider that this kind of proportionality was already somehow in these steps um, by the court or, or will be applied additionally or will not need it? What is your, your opinion on this, on this part? Um, well, here um, uh, within the specific um, within the specific uh, context of um, um, of SEPs, uh, I would say that this is um, this is a, um, a proportionality um, requirement um, which is uh, which is explicitly spelled out um, by um, by the uh, European Court of Justice. So here it has um, uh, to, to uh, give guidelines for um, the specific negotiations. Um, this is uh, uh, this was uh, this was meant. Um, um, to guarantee uh, also a proportionality and uh, yeah to balance the interests of the parties concerned um, uh, uh, in each particular case so this is an expression also of the proportionality principle um, however within the uh, specific context of uh, SEPs and I have another question here for the audience Will the public interest defense 
possible and effective to counter an injunction in Germany. Um, for example, in cases where the injunction would affect the general public, uh, like in case of service, health service, etc. Um, only in very um, this would this can only ha uh, happen in very. Um, in very limited um, uh, in very limited circumstances um, uh, uh, the thresholds uh, the thresholds are um, are there are certain thresholds spelled out by um, the patent act however um, they are uh, they are quite high so this is um, well um, this is not something which could um, which could um, take the place of a proportionality assessment um, as it is currently discussed. So in these cases that I have been addressing um, concerning um, that we have only a very small component of a complex system which is um, uh, which is uh, uh, which is um, uh, violate uh, which is infringing the um, patented technology and uh, just because of this s small I would say infringement the whole system has to be um, taken from the market so um, uh, here in these in these cases uh, there's uh, there is no public interest defense and certainly it cannot take a uh, the the it cannot take the um, the place of a proportionality, de disproportionality defense that is currently discussed. Right. Um, is there any other questions? Because um, I have not received anything more from the chat. Uh, there is now a question. Um, the German Ministry of Justice is currently investigating the need for introducing proportionality. Would you say that your position as expressed today is the general view of the German judges? Well, as I am not a German judge, um, I, cannot, uh, I cannot say whether this is uh, their general view. Um, I have only expressed my personal views and um, um, uh, my, personal, uh, my personal views um, trying to base my arguments on uh, the the patent system as a whole and uh, and uh, its uh, its disturbance um, which might be caused by such a um, proportionality as a, uh, a general proportionality assessment so, so to make myself clear again um, I think that uh, the law as it is right now allowing for the good faith defense that is sufficient to um, uh, uh, to assess the cases where a real hardship exists um, but uh, those cases where it is just a uh, uh, the question of striking a balance of convenience or of one party having the feeling to be treated in an unfair way, um, I think this should not become part of the German law. But this is my personal um, point of view. Um, I have another question regarding the um, uh, Verband der Automobile Industry, so the Association of Automotive in Germany. Uh, how likely or will uh, this association succeed in the movement for legislative reform to introduce proportionality to German injunction? Well, um, um, I know that they have uh, the uh, that there has been uh, considerable lobby work um, to uh, especially by the uh, automotive industry in Germany. Um, uh, uh, to uh, uh, to um, uh, introduce this proportionality requirement, so this is why we are why we are doing this discussion, or we're we having this discussion since several years. Um, however, um, the, the Ministry of Justice will um, as uh, will have uh, is investigating. This is right. They will have. Um, uh, they will um, listen to the interest groups concerned in uh, in several in some days, um, but I have I, I cannot predict 
in any way um, uh, whether the uh, automotive industry will be uh, success successful for well uh, as everyone knows uh, the automotive industry is very powerful in Germany so um, uh, they would um, maybe they have uh, they have enough power but um, as i said from a, uh, from my legal point of view from my legal opinion i think this would not be a good idea thank you any other questions from the audience Okay, so far I see no further questions. Um, I would like to thank you very much, um, Professor Tochtemann, for, for sharing your, your personal views on, on this very interesting and challenging topic. And to all of you for participating also actively with your questions. And if you subscribe, you will also, um, to, to Corepi Council, you will also be able to receive the updates and um, also regarding future webinars and case law. Uh, as explained before, we will uh, upload um, the, um, this presentation as well as the slides and um, a short paper um, reflecting the key messages for, for this. I understand you are also um, writing a, a longer version of the paper. Um, will you share some thoughts of when this will publish and, and where? Yes, um, certainly. So the longer version of this pr uh, of this presentation will be published in uh, uh, in a German journal, um, uh, uh, which is. Um, at, uh, which is called uh, ZGE, uh, Zeitschrift für Geistiges Eigentum. However, um, this, uh, this will be um, uh, written in English language, so uh, it, is, um, uh, it will be available also for international readers. And uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, this um, publication is also available uh, um, for international um, access. All right. Sounds great. Looking forward to, to reading it. Thank you uh, so much. Thanks a lot again for joining. Thank you also. I also thank everyone uh, for joining and uh, for listening to my thoughts. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.